Hello. In this talk, I'm going to be talking to you about the benefits of evidence-based conservation and what the Conservation Evidence Project is doing to help you implement this in your work. As we all know, biodiversity loss is an increasing risk globally. There are many reports now showing that biodiversity loss is increasing and many governments, organisations worldwide are thinking of how best to tackle this. But making decisions about what actions we should be taking to address this is really complicated. We need to take lots of factors into consideration. This includes things such as local knowledge, indigenous and traditional knowledge, expert opinion, social values and cultures, costs, guidance, resources, feasibility, and the scientific evidence. Evidence-based practice is a tool that can help us to take all of those different forms of knowledge to make the best decisions for our conservation projects. As I'm talking a lot about evidence today, I thought it would be good to give some definitions of what exactly I mean. Evidence is any relevant information that you might use to assess one or more hypotheses related to a question of interest. Scientific evidence specifically refers to information that has been collected using a scientific method. This includes published peer-reviewed studies and unpublished studies in theses or reports. Evidence-based practice requires that decisions are based upon the best available current, valid and relevant evidence and that these decisions are informed by the tacit and explicit knowledge of those making the decision and within the context of available resources. Evidence-based practice is widely used in different fields, predominantly in healthcare, where it took off in the 1970s, but also in fields such as crime and education. And this is because using evidence improves decision-making. Appropriate use and searching for evidence ensures that the best possible understanding of likely consequences of actions. It facilitates systematic collation and synthesis of evidence from various sources. This also helps to reduce bias and cherry picking. It can increase the transparency of decisions that are being made and can also help us to identify gaps in the knowledge and see where we might need to be collecting more data. Overall, this helps to increase the effectiveness of management actions and optimises the use of funds and prevents wasted resources, both of which are scarce in conservation. It's also becoming increasingly expected in biodiversity management. In the UK, Natural England and SAIM are both promoting this kind of approach in the work. However, using evidence isn't always done. In fact, there are many examples of where it's not done. For example, in the UK, bat gantries, which are supposed to mitigate for collisions of bats with vehicles on new roads, have been used for over a decade at a total cost of around two and a half million pounds. However, studies have shown that they are ineffective. Despite these studies, they still continue to be used and installed today. This has led to wasted time, money, resources, bad press, but importantly, there's been no reduction in bat mortality. In another example, a recent synopsis from conservation evidence showed that translocation of large carnivores away from areas of human settlement as a method to reduce human wildlife conflict isn't always effective. Studies have shown that often these large carnivores move back into the area and continue attacking. And in some rates, in some cases, the rates of attacks actually increase after translocation. So what scientific evidence is available to help us make decisions in conservation and biodiversity management? There's a growing scientific evidence base available. For example, in 1995, there were only around 200 papers, including the words biodiversity and conservation. But by 2018, this number had jumped to over 5,000 papers. And in the same year, around 14 or more papers on biodiversity conservation were being published every day. There's also an increasing number of journals dedicated to this subject area. 
And if we look at where these studies are coming from, we're also increasing the global evidence base. In 1995, the majority of studies were coming from North America and Europe, whilst in 2018, we see that papers are coming increasingly from South America, India, Asia and other parts of the world. However, whilst having this information is great for helping us make decisions, this can be incredibly overwhelming. All of this information takes a lot of time to find, read and interpret, which can actually lead to people not wanting to use it at all. And this can lead to something known as the research implementation gap, where the information is available, but people aren't using it. And this is just one of many barriers to evidence use in conservation. As I've mentioned, there's often not enough time for busy practitioners to find, read and interpret the information and decide whether it's relevant to their specific context. Often, much of the information is difficult to access. It might be behind paywalls or other barriers. Scientific papers often contain a lot of jargon and complicated statistics. There are also organisational challenges in improving the use of scientific evidence. And very often, the right evidence is not available. Researchers are not answering the questions that practitioners are asking. There are many studies that have investigated what information conservation professionals are using in their decision making. These studies have been conducted in Australia, the UK, Switzerland, Madagascar and many other places. And the general picture is that scientific evidence is not commonly used, whereas experience and local knowledge is used quite frequently. The Conservation Evidence Project was designed to help overcome some of these co common barriers. Conservation Evidence is a free resource that summarises the evidence for con conservation interventions. It gathers evidence using a synthesis method where journals are systematically searched issue by issue for papers that directly test conservation interventions and it reports the results. These results are presented in a database that you can search online, but it's also available in PDFs that you can download. Conservation evidence summarises the documented evidence for the effectiveness of conservation actions. However, it does not cover things such as threats or population trends. Information is divided into synopses Synopses are classified by taxonomic group or habitat type. To date, there are 21 synopses and there are more due out later this year. By 2024, the plan is to have covered all taxonomic groups and habitats. In addition to this, there is an annual publication called What Works in Conservation. In addition to the summarised information in the synopses, each action is assigned an overall effectiveness score. This ranges from beneficial through to likely to be harmful. These scores have been voted on by experts in each of those areas. These scores are available to view on the database, as well as in the PDF version of What Works in Conservation. So, for example, if you went onto the Conservation Evidence website to look at whether back gantries are likely to be an effective mitigation measure for your new road installation, you would easily be able to see that they have been assigned a category of unlikely to be beneficial based upon the available evidence. You would also be able to quickly find an alternative measure. For example, installing underpasses or culverts as crossing structures has been assigned likely to be beneficial based upon the available studies. You can find more information about how to search the website and the type of information that's available in our other video on how to use the Conservation Evidence website. 
So how good is the scientific evidence space for conservation actions? Because conservation evidence has systematically searched journals for any papers testing conservation actions, we've been able to analyse what information is available. This is the work of Alec Christie. He showed that whilst a lot of data is out there, it mostly uses weaker study designs and there are big spatial biases. For example, if you look at the picture on the left hand side, this comes from the bird conservation synopsis. You can see that most studies have come from North America and Europe, and then most of them use weaker study designs such as after or before after. He also showed that many taxa are much less studied. You can see in the figure here from the amphibian conservation synopsis, the number of studies is much smaller than that for birds. Each time a synopsis is published, we're able to assess how many actions no evidence has been found for. For the recently published terrestrial mammal synopsis, nearly 25% of actions still had no documented evidence behind them, despite this being a widely studied group. For example, Coppicing is a commonly used action in the UK for creating and maintaining habitat for dormice. However, we were unable to find any studies testing the effectiveness of this method. To help fill these gaps, Conservation Evidence has its own journal. It publishes research, monitoring results and case studies on the effects of conservation interventions. So if you have some information available that you would like to share with the rest of the conservation community, you can do this through the Conservation Evidence Journal. Thank you for watching this introductory video on evidence-based conservation and the Conservation Evidence Project. We have other videos available for information on other aspects of the projects, such as tools, guidance, and other information available to help you use evidence more widely in your work, videos on how to use the website, and also how you can get involved through our partnership programme. Thank you for watching.